Hello, welcome back to OT the podcast. We're here to talk about watches, time, and how to spend it. I'm Andy Green. Felix Schultz. Felix. Reporting live from Geneva. I, I miss you, Felix. It's been a couple of weeks now. You're overseas. You're gallivanting around. We, we don't have our daily chats. Well, we, we, we still got the messages, but we don't have uh, your your evening commute phone calls. Yeah, I don't know if I um I don't know if I've got FOMO from the fair or FOMO from from like you. I miss I don't know. Do I miss you? Wow. Do I miss the I just, fair? I just can't be quit of you, Andy. Mm, I just can't shake mm. you. Um, so you, we caught up earlier this week. We had a chat. That episode went yep. up recently. Uh, obviously, that was sort of after day one, I think, of the fair. So you've you know had a, four more days, a bunch more meetings. I've caught you before you're going off uh, to do a manufacturer tour, which we can talk about later. Um, yep. So today, I feel like let's have a let's have a bit of a chat, and then I want to hear who you've been bit talking of a debrief, to. Debrief, bit of a yeah. No, uh, this is a debrief. You know. Oh, that's the title: debrief episode. Oh, the debrief. Yeah, because I mean, uh, as of the time of we're recording, it's it's Saturday morning. Like the form mm. is the fair is formally over. Like there's still heaps to do, but um, I'm planning to have a little bit of a chill day chill day um debrief episode that's the title uh and this episode couldn't have been done without the support of this week's sponsor who is tag hoyer same as last week uh and i think same as next week so we're gonna have a bit more of a chat about what tag hoyer have done this year yeah we're not gonna we're not gonna talk about it we're gonna get our uh our good friend uh nicholas byback the heritage director of tag hoyer to uh talk us a little bit about the history of the carrera which is 60 years old well i'm excited Uh, for that because nicholas he knows I mean, he knows Tag Heuer Heritage really well, Hoya Her- Heritage really well. We had a big chat with him last year, I believe. Yeah, that was last year. Just a great guy to talk to. So I am excited to hear what you and Nick talk about. Um, mm. But seeing as you are coming home, I do want to kind of bring something not watch related. I'm sure you're, you're just about sick of watches at this yeah. point. <laughs> but we like to talk about movies, TVs. I kind of want to know what you've got lined up for your flight home. Have you downloaded anything? Well, look, this is this is a great question. So on the way over... Um, mm. Yeah, what did you watch? It was a night flight, so I didn't really mm. watch too much. Uh, it's like I 30 had... hours. <laughs> Sorry? It's a 30-hour flight. What do you mean you didn't watch too much? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, I just I stare blankly into the space <laughs> like a robot when I'm not working. Uh, <laughs> I, I go into, like, power-saving mode. Uh, no, what did I watch? I watched Top Gun. I watched Top Gun in a plane during turbulence. Which oh. is pretty cool. Live action it was we, yeah. we went and saw Top Gun. So you just rewatched it? Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a perfect plane movie. Like, because, mm. not be just because it's about planes. And what else? I tried to watch. Um, uh, you know, I'm a massive Jack Black fan. Mm, mm, as um, am I. As is my son. Mm. Uh, so I tried to watch King Kong. Like <laughs> the. Which was I don't know if you remember it was like 2005. Mm. Peter Jackson like made it after Lord of the Rings. Yep, oh, it's a weird movie, man. Big budget, like it's big, like a lot of budget and some some odd choices. But uh, I watched about half of it. I don't know. But uh, as one of my Australian press colleagues said, my flight on the way back is a new month, and apparently the airlines update their movies on the first of the month. So. I have heard that they cycle through. Um, the other thing I've been really strenuously doing, and it's been sort of getting a fair bit of discussion here at uh, Watchers and Wonders, is Succession. Mm. I've been tr- trying so hard to avoid spoilers. I know there's a lot of discussion around a bag that's ruined yep. uh, a certain fashion label's share price <laughs> because of Tom Wom's cams. <laughs> But uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't have any, any firm plans. Uh, and also, depressingly, Andy, I'll probably be doing a bit of work on the plane too because I'm that guy now. It's focus time. Well, I'm gonna throw a suggestion your way. I just finished watching uh, Shrinking, which is on Apple TV. I don't know if you still have your subscription. No. Nah, if dead you dead. don't, set up a new one. So, so Jason Siegel. Mm-hmm. Uh, is this Harrison Ford? St- Harrison Ford's in it. Krista Miller, Jessica Williams. Great cast. Also uh, written by Jason Siegel, but do you know who else wrote it? Can I have? Can you give me one hint and I'll give it a guess? Uh, oh, he's here. Uh, he's there. It? He's every fucking where. Oh yeah, Roy Kent. Uh, yeah. yeah, I did know that actually. My other guess was going to be Therese Stern, but he's he seems pretty busy. He didn't. Yeah, he didn't write it. Co-written by Brett Goldstein, who plays Roy Kent yeah, in nice. Ted Lasso. Yep. It's about yep. kind of like a multi generational psychology kind of clinic tackles some really interesting father-daughter relationships mentor-mentee relationships 
I thought it was like a really nice show and then I, I made the mistake of reading some reviews and it, some people hated it. Some people did not like it at all, but I found it quite enjoyable and quite what, wholesome uh, at what times. What does it say about you? Maybe you've just got bad taste. Maybe I have bad taste. Oh, well, I think it's mixed. I'm, I, I quite like Jason Segel. He seems like a good guy. He seems like he's, I think he's pretty funny. Sure. I like Harrison Ford. I think, I think it's nice. I think you should check it out. Okay, okay. Uh, because uh, Roy Kent also wrote, um, he was one of the writers for mm. uh, Ted Lasso, wasn't he, as well? Cool. Well, uh, I might download that. Maybe I'll... Uh, mm, well, Ted's also back. To Ted Lasso. Yeah, Ted's also yeah. back. It's, it's a, oh, this was also a discussion had around here. Mm. you got to get like uh, a significant other sign-off on yep. those key viewing decisions. Otherwise, yep. which is why, I mean, Top Gun and King Kong were pretty safe choices. Um, mm. Yeah. Anyway, um, do you know what we did not discuss? Uh, television or you know, airplane commute mm-hmm. strategies. While I had my short interview appointment with a very very busy uh, uh, and very very excited Nicholas Byback. I mean, considering what Tag Heuer have released this year, which is, I mean, the anniversary of the Carrera these nods to kind of modern technical pieces that really kind of stay true to that heritage. I think this is going to be a good chat. Now you caught yeah. up with him, but this is a two-parter. So this is, we're getting part one. Yeah. Now. So, so, yep. So we've, we had like a, a 20 minute, a 20 minute chat, but we broke it up into to two little mini interviews. So you'll get next week. Cool. Next week. Or the, the second part next week rather. Mm. Uh, but, but yeah, let's, uh, let's jump in. All right. I can't wait. Uh, we're here with the one and only, uh, Nicholas Bybuck. What's your job title? I am heritage director at Tag Heuer. And what a heritage to be shepherding and safeguarding into the bright future of the world. Um, this year Tag Heuer is celebrating a fairly auspicious anniversary, 60 years of the Carrera. Yep. What is the secret of its success, Nicholas? Uh, So, I like to distill this down into three key elements that have made the Carrera so popular among so many people. I think, first of all, we can really describe the watch as a design icon. Uh, I think there's really nothing else like it. Of course, I'm slightly biased, but I, I always think of it as the kind of quintessential racing chronograph. Of course, there are many comparables, but I think they're all really imitators versus what the Carrera offers regarding the legibility, the pure design sensibilities that Jack, uh, under his leadership, managed to distill down into it. You can see all of these, his great love of mid-century modern design working its way into the Carrera. I think beyond that is the innovation, uh, of course, starting off with things like the tension ring, moving forward with the automatic chronograph movement, and of course today on to, to wild stuff like plasma. Um, and the third thing for me is the personalities, of course. I've mentioned Jack already. I'll mention him many times again uh, in this podcast, no doubt. But he, he was such a key part of the project. But beyond that, we see the greatest drivers in the world uh, wearing the watches and, of course, icons of, of culture. Uh, this great picture that we had of Mick Jagger that we used during the keynote, you can see so many great personalities uh, wearing the career. And it, it's that human connection which I think makes it so powerful. That's an exceptional answer. Um, I try sometimes, that's, Felix. Yeah, I mean, look, I can tell you've <laughs> spent a fair bit of time thinking about that uh, and perhaps answering similar questions this week. I uh, wouldn't be so bold to presume. 60 years is a long time and it can often get distilled into, you know, sort of marketing highlights. Sure. But I think the watch industry has also changed uh a huge amount in 60 years. Mm-hmm. What are some sort of elements of the Carrera story? Like I know, you know, the, the Carrera Pan Americana, you know, all these sort of top line notes that we, yeah. you know, we all love. Are there any sort of parts of that long journey that people listening might not be aware of or sort of, you know, hidden gems that we should shine a light on? Yeah, I, I think it's easy when a brand is doing a rec- retrospective of an iconic model to only think about the the positive moments and the highlights of course you know everyone knows the Carrera Panamericana story and of course everyone can rush out and buy this wonderful book in September uh, that will tell more of these uh, these great stories um, and in it I mean I, I've touched on some of them because for example during the courts crisis of course the courts crisis we think was inexpensive watches coming from Japan that that, that, that killed the Swiss watchmaking industry it was more complicated than that we had you know inefficiency in the supply chain you know macroeconomic challenges as well but even in the middle of all of this 
uh, Jack set up Hoya Micro Technique to focus on electronics, uh, mm. first with timing equipment, then later with the, the Quartz three-hand Carreras. And when you think of these kind of revolutionary moments happening behind closed doors in under these very challenging circumstances, it, it says a lot. And, you know, moving a bit further forward, you know, the relaunch in 1996, uh, it, it's a key moment for the collection that no one's reflected on quite that thoroughly. So we've tried to tell that story a bit more. And then the crazy designs that have happened since 2000, particularly the 2005 uplift that added an external bezel. Yeah, right. I, I'm, I'm just sort of going off, off script here a little bit. This is not the first time this, this, this week or recently I've heard a more complex um, discussion or a more nuanced discussion of the, the, the quote-unquote quote, quartz crisis. Mm -hmm. Do you think, you know, again, it's typically, yeah, there's that story of, you know, you know, Japanese automation and quartz technology. But, yeah, everyone else, you know, there's that more, there's the gold, there's all these other factors. Is this symbolic of, like, a wider maturity in, like, the discourse around watches or are we just sort of get more further away from it and looking back with a more nuanced lens? I, I think it's worth considering that. I'm not Swiss, number one. I'm from, yes. I come from outside of the industry. <laughs> yeah. um, you didn't lose your job or your father didn't lose his job. Yeah, and I mean, when yeah. you look at just at Le Chaux de Fond, Le Loc, you know, it went from 90,000 people at the beginning of the 70s to 30,000 people at the end of the 70s yeah, wow. in the watchmaking industry. So, you know, 65% of the people lost their jobs. I, I can understand why it's such a sensitive and complicated issue. Of course, um, in Switzerland, it's called the Quartz Crisis. In Japan, it's famously called the Quartz Revolution. Yes. And I think that says a lot about the kind of underlying sentiment. But I think part of the challenge of the watchmaking industry that it's run on some pretty liberal use of facts uh, over the years, uh, particularly pre-internet days where it was difficult to fact check things. I think today the reality is consumers are much more engaged. They're much quicker to call out uh, shall we say BS uh, when they see it uh, and as a result brands have to be exponentially more transparent and with that it means that when you tell these stories again you can dig down a little bit deeper and also reflect on the fact that bad things don't just result in bad situations they can also make you stronger if the brand survives through it there's a story to tell of resilience and strength and everything else and when we see these nuances I think that helps to support those narratives. Um, in a perfect segue there, how does how has surviving that that sort of turmoil uh, and coming out the other side made you know turned Hoyer into Tag Hoyer obviously yes uh, and how has it uh, made the Carrera in particular stronger over the years or how yeah how has the Carrera got better over time yeah I. I I know as enthusiasts, it's very easy to malign the fact that Hoyer became Tag Hoyer and, you know, that people still gripe about the fact that there's these three letters above the, the Shield logo. Sure, get but it's, it. Yeah, and it's important to remember that avant-garde, uh, by name, by nature, you know, it, it really embraces the kind of core founding philosophies of the brand going back to the beginning. So, you know, such is life. And of course, as you know, in such a great market as Australia, mm. most people walk into a boutique and they don't say, I want a Hoyer or a Tag Hoyer. They just say, I want a Tag. Yep. Uh, and when you have the power of that name, you, you maintain that. Um, of course, the Carrera was discontinued just in advance of Tag's acquisition in 1984. Uh, well, the Carrera was discontinued in 84. Tag would finalize the acquisition 1st of January, 1986. Carrera would have a 12 year hiatus and nice. return in 1996. And that return, probably only really could happen under those circumstances where they'd had the uh, the Formula One made of, uh, of plastic, they'd had the series watches, including the Sports Elegant, that would become the Link. And in the mid-1990s, it was a time when mechanical watchmaking was returning, things were rebounding, and the management at the time reflected on the history of the Maison, saw these super iconic models and thought, okay, let's try copying an exact design from the original. Of course, many brands are doing this today, but at the time it was very revolutionary. And it was meant to be 5,000 pieces of limited edition. It was exponentially more successful than that. And then when LVMH took over, it made the Carrera one of the core pillars. So I think without this death and rebirth, the Carrera wouldn't be nearly as strong and nearly as successful as it is today. Same happened with the Porsche 911. Mm. You know, the 911 nearly died. And it wasn't until... The 964 was kind of the flag bearer, but still carrying a lot over from the G body. And it wasn't until the 996 in 1997 yep. that, you know, really moved significantly forward. Interesting. Um, <laughs> I'm about to, we're going to about to wrap up part one of our two-part mini-series sure. on uh, the Carrera at 60. Uh, I would like to ask, is... Are we still, or are you, I suspect, as maybe one of the more active people in this place, 
are we still discovering new things about the Carrera? Obviously, the story's been told a lot. Mm. I think it's also important to remember that Tagua, well, Hoyer lost a lot of its archives in 1982 during the acquisition of Piaget. As a result, I was thinking that during the telling of the Carrera story, there wouldn't be much new information to unearth. But honestly, I surprised myself. I think looking at things from a slightly different perspective, trying to tell a more narrative point of view, yeah. it's maybe not... Uh, brought new facts to light, but I think with fresh eyes, going back to what you said about the court's crisis, I think with fresh eyes and a fresher understanding of that things aren't black and white, they are more nuanced. I think when you take into account this kind of more complicated set of situations, whether it's Jack negotiating with Enzo Ferrari or the launch of the, the complicated Carreras in the mid-2000s, uh, you know, it's it's more complex than, than first meets the eye. So I think that that's one element. The other fact is, is we have found some pretty damn cool photos that haven't yes. really seen the light of day before, like Jack presenting Enzo Ferrari with a Hoyer watch box uh, sometime in the early 1970s. Oh, and coming to a Hoyer billboard cool. soon. Well, yeah, yeah. great <laughs> photos of Claire Egidsone, Ronnie Peterson, and Jackie Ix standing with Jack at the Ferrari fra factory in the mid-1970s, you know, just amazing stuff that yeah, was just cool. sitting in the basement that hadn't really been looked at. Hey, and uh, uh, is, it, is it appropriate for a small bit of shameless uh, self-promotion for you? You are writing a book, what's the, <laughs> or you've written it, or what's the, uh, can we talk about this, or should I cut it out? I, I, unlike, uh, unlike Chris Hall, I'm not very good at self-promoting myself. Oh, uh, wow, a deep Chris Hall <laughs> cut. Um, um, no, but I, uh, yes, I did contribute uh, something around 20,000 words to the new Carrera book, so it's yes. been a fun project. Uh, it was many evenings and weekends over the past few months, but, uh, you know, let's see how people review my writing. Do, do, when, when's it going to be available? Can so you... we, we've got the preview that's being handed out now, yeah. uh, at the fair, which is six or seven thousand words, yep. the final book will be out in September. I think is the plan. Cool. Eagerly awaiting that. Uh, in the meantime, find out more about the Carrera and the new Carreras, which we'll talk about in a hot second, uh, which means next week, uh, at taghoyer.com. Stay tuned. We're going to come back with more Nick. Oh, it's like a radio. And we're back. Uh, what a guy. What a guy. He's he. I mean, exhausted. We were all exhausted at that point, but. Uh, I, I put a wrist shot. I put a wrist shot up, and I should do mm. it for for show notes um, or, or on our OT. Send it over of like the new the new inverse Panda Carrera and the one the, the OG on um, I think it's a two four two four four seven um, on Nicholas's wrist, and they are remarkably similar. It's it's but not in like a reissue way. Like it is, it's a, it's a pretty smooth update. Um, yeah, I really liked it. Tag Heuer in general was phenomenal and there was a lot of sort of stuff that I just got a sneak peek of for the second half of the year that is I, I'm as hearing not, that. if not more exciting. I'm hearing some some stuff stash for the later some whispers. The whispers, murmurs in the in the corridors of watches and wonders around um you know is, the is second. your is your net your network of little birds extends even to Geneva. Yeah, I'm hearing the I'm hearing the whispers in the wind. Uh, what's the buzz like around Tagway? Is it that a sentiment kind of a lot of people share? I think so. I think people, I think one of the things that uh, was mentioned by a few people was that they're nailing it in terms of a strategy, like mm -hmm. where they're going, like they know that, which I think is half the work. At least um, half, at least half. Yeah, and that like, you know, once once you know what you want to be doing, the watches and the and the marketing and the, the storytelling and all that sort of comes along with it. But yeah, yeah, they were, they good. were, it was cool. It was a, it was a good vibe. I don't know if you saw shots like they had a Porsche in the booth and <laughs> looked amazing. They've got a, yeah, they've got this, um, like the shot of movie, mm. uh, that sort of, I think we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks time. That's sort of like their, their big Carrera launch campaign, like the public campaign. Side by side with the Porsche. I mean, I, the assets, they sent over the assets and what, I was genuinely impressed with with the photography and the photos of um, Ryan Gosling with mm. the Carrera in the Carrera. Like these photos were incredible. We used them for the show notes last week. Mm. Him sitting in the car, kind of obviously inspired by the film Drive. Uh, but they were amazing. Like these, some of the best kind of product assets. Look, I reckon you, you, you between us, we've got the, the contacts that if you wanted mm. like, one of the sort of the printouts I use for like billboard 
or yeah. you know outdoor advertising, you could get one for your bedroom wall, Andy. Oh, I kind of want the, 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 like Miami Sunset with that gradient. Yeah, it was it was a, OT a, branding. Honestly, uh, OT branding vibes. Uh, anyway, <laughs> thank you, Tag Hoyer. We appreciate the support. Uh, you know, obviously, it helps Felix Galvan around the world and enjoy himself on these work creation trips. Um, so we appreciate that. Rude, Felix, Andy. Rude. Last week we covered, you know, Rolex, Tudor, Cartier, a bit of Patek. I want to hear what other brands you've seen and then, like, let's have a bit of a dive into maybe some highlights from the brands, maybe some surprises. So maybe Look, uh, we start th- with Oris. Fair call. Hey, uh, just so that everyone's clear, I'm hoping mm. that you're going to uh, ask me questions because mm-hmm. it is taking probably 80% of my energy to sound cool and engaging right now. Yep. Uh, the other 20% of me is, is looking at the hotel bed uh, across the way and I just want to be face down on it, like unconscious. So <laughs> that's where I'm at. Oris. Oris was great. Um, again, some interesting things coming mm-hmm. later on, but the the pro pilot Kermit um, yes. uh, was one of the the genuine talking points uh, of, of the fair. Like everyone was... You know, there's a few watches that sort of bubble to the top of like, yep. oh, have you seen that? Like, oh, you know, like the puzzle watch from Rolex and, you know, other bits and bobs. But the Kermit was one of them. Yeah, um, real standout. So that's the Pro Pilot X Calibre 400. That's the bold yes. green dial yep, the with a Kermit. Titanium. The front really, really of- nice. Um, super fun, obviously. The, the, so K- there's Kermit on the date window on the first of the month. Mm. Oh, nice. Um, so today? Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess. Well, I mean, on the Oris booth, I think every day was the first of the month, for, <laughs> for, you know, because that's all people wanted to see, obviously. Uh, the, the, the dial is pretty, it's like, it's iridescent. It's almost like neon green. So for me, it's a, it's a little bit off Kermit's actual skin tone, but it, right. it's, it makes an impression. The other thing about it that's, that's, it's not like a negative, but it's a thing to note because we have had a few questions about it, I think, in our Discord. Mm-hmm. Um, which, which, by the way, is where I've just been trying... Like, I've been terrible just at social media. Dropping it. But I'm being trying to, like, just dump little photos and, like, answer questions there, which which seems to have uh, been working well. So, yeah, uh, log on to that. Get onto that if you haven't... A little photo already. dump, yeah. But, yeah, what I was saying, uh, the Oris, it is... Uh, there's a very little contrast on the dial, so... Um, because it's so bright and so green, you need to like it's it's not what uh, as I would say in the world of pilots watches, instantly legible. Right. You know, you need to look at it properly to to get the time. Right. So it's that light green with the white markers and then the white yeah, on the hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a um, but it's hot. I, I mean, I've always liked the um, that that particular watch. You know, I've had the hots for it. Mm. Uh, and and. Everyone, whenever I saw Oris, I, I caught up with Oris a few times over the week, um, including a little a brief chat with their CEO, uh, Rolf. Mm-hmm. Let's mm-hmm. just say that I think everyone's trying to convince them to do Miss Piggy next year. Oh, they, yes. They're, they're, really? all being, they're all being very coy. Like, Interesting. But I don't... I mean, maybe it's going to be a one and done, but give the people what they want, Oris. Well, if they, this is in partnerships or a collaboration with Disney, so I'm imagine. Oh yes. Going through By the, the way, they're also very clear about the uh, how seriously Disney take protecting their IP. Yes. Uh, yep. Incredibly serious. So if they've gone through the hoops to get this approved, then I imagine there might be a little bit more. Also, there's a pretty cute video on the Oris website, which we'll have to link up, which has uh, Kermit doing things through the date window as if it's an actual window, and it's it's very oh kind of. God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like sitting halfway out of it, playing a banjo and watering some plants. Yeah, classic. And playing. Yeah, classic. yeah, it's very, it's very, very um, cute and wholesome. One thing people kind of mentioned about this watch from afar, which I think you were well versed to answer, is how's the green? Is it is it a bit much? Do you think it's going to be overpowering? I'm sort of, I don't think watch, watch styles pow- like have the power to really dominate an outfit, given you know it's four centimeters yeah but what's i like mean what it's like what's like like 35 millimeters of color um yeah. but it, it is pretty intense mm. i will say that like it's not a subtle watch it's a it's not oh this is gonna pair perfectly with my you know suit it is you're gonna be people will notice you wear that watch i'm trying well, to think okay. of a it, it, it's the sort of green that you would get on a 
on a particular shade of high vis vest at night. So it's okay. it's made with visibility in mind. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. Okay. Well, sounds like that's the highlight from Morris. I want to I want to move on to a brand which you again are very fond of, Hermes. Mm. So a bit of a talking yeah. point is the H O eight collection. I brashly um, said it's a great way to kind of build up your Birkin profile. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? What's has, what's going has, on with Hermes? Has, has, has Hermes been in touch with you, uh, asking you to cease and desist? <laughs> you know, sharing strategies. I don't know. Whatever they do. Um, look, I mean that that was my that's my, um, my uh, everyone asks you at watches about is oh what if you like what's your favorite like. You know, both the brands and other people because the brands are also doing like, you know, competitor analysis and, yep. you know, getting, yeah, the, yeah. getting What's the, going on? the insights from, you know, the, the media and stuff. My go-to answer was Hermes. Um, and I can't remember if we spoke about this last episode. Uh, I think we mentioned it a little bit. But yeah, they're, they're, they, they're such an, a, a sophisticated and accomplished brand all round that it's no surprise that when they do a watch, it's not half-assed. Um, mm. so the, the design and the, the language that they've got around the HOA is that it's an all terrain watch. Um, what does that mean? It's like, a, it's, it's a sports watch, but like you don't, uh, uh, like the, the Santos, um, Cartier Santos is a sports watch, the, uh, an all terrain watch. I would say the, something like the Odysseus is an all terrain watch. The, uh, uh, Aquanaut, you know, like they're not made for a specific, like they're not divers' watches. They're not. They're just meant for a, a bit more day-to-day dur -day durability. That's what I take from it. But H O eight, really sophisticated design. Anyway, like the the dial design is doesn't miss a beat. The case is sort of modern and is its own thing, without being boring. Uh, and this year they've brought there's a, there's a monopusha chronograph in carbon. That's, mm -hmm. that's nice, but the ones I, because I'm, you know, famously not a chronograph guy, um, the ones I was drawn to were the new H8 three-hand variations with a fiberglass case uh, with a ceramic bezel and crown. So, yep. again, they've added like four different colorways, decent, um, you know, technical materials that aren't over the top and give it a sort of a lightness and the and the that's right the, the the it's braided braided glass fibers infused with like aluminium and slate powder Graf is that graphene like powder a, isn't it yeah something like that yeah yeah um, it's a composite it's it's really nice it's 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 a nice watch it's not a stupid amount of money in the in the realm of you know watches it's luxury Swiss watches uh, and it's something a bit different like. That's got the really nice second hand as well, doesn't it? Sort of like balanced yeah, halfway. Uh, yep, yep. Really, really complex dial. That beautiful font that they've, you know, got designed in-house. Uh, it's it's the sort of watch, like, it will appeal to, like, people that know watches, but also to people that just, like, want to have a nice thing. And I think it's such a good... This God, it sounds so interesting. It's such a good product. Uh, <laughs> but it, it really is. And that's... My my other sort of highlight, like all the watches I've really been taken by this year have either exhibited, you know, extraordinary sort of craftsmanship on a, you know, a finishing or uh, that front, or they've just been well-rounded watches that taste like a real watch uh, <laughs> to, to, you know, paraphrase a famous milk advertisement from the 90s. <laughs> yeah. Very good, Felix. Very good. Thanks, mate. Thanks. <laughs> JLC, that yes. is, you sent a bunch of photos to me. It kind of looked like they were doing some some nice kind of refined updates, some things with straps. What, what Run me through what JLC have sort of been dropping this year. Reverso, um, you know, no surprises there. They've, they're leaning heavily into the Reverso as their like sort of key differentiator, um, which makes perfect sense. Uh, the chronograph. I mean, this this is a conversation that I think we we sort of had uh, on WhatsApp. I'm like, it's twenty thousand francs mm -hmm. for the Reverso chronograph in steel, which has quite a. Uh, it's a new movement. It's got a. Uh, it's the first time I've seen a chronograph in a Reverso for a while. I think maybe since Squadra, in like the early two thousands vibes. Um, mm -hmm. 
uh, it's it's sort of c- quite um, contemporary in feel. Like reversos can be quite you know sort of old worldy a lot of the time because of the. And you're talking the about the blue dial, aren't you? The blue dial chronograph. I think it's grey. Mm, I think there's a blue one as blue. well. Bluey grey, thirty four eight hundred Aussie dollars. Yeah, that so that's. Oh. I don't know. I'm going to have to do some fact checking on that in steel. In steel. Yeah. So, well, look, that was a classic example of me like surrounded by hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of watches going, mm. oh, this seems like a great value. And it, it probably is, to be honest. But it's, it's, for me, it's something quite new and it's a good, like, it offers a different twist on their sort of, you know, classic case. The hey, other it one looks that, nice. It looks yeah, nice. It wears nice. The other one that I was super into was the, uh, I think it's called the Reverso One Precious Colors. But it's it's you know made with women in mind. It's a sort of their smallest model, but it's uh, fully enamel, fully enameled. Oh, that outer kind case. of wraps around. Fully enameled outer case with like inset, sort of a few bars of diamonds, and the enamels done in like uh, a sort of a, a straight geometric pattern of like stripes. Kind of looks like ribbons, doesn't paint. it? Paint. Yeah, they hand paint it. Like that's not that's like by eye because they. They don't like uh, inset the enamel into the case and like uh, champlevé it. Um, mm. But yeah, really, really beautiful, beautiful, beautiful watch. Yeah, that's good. That that's yeah, sparkly, ribbony, enamely beautifulness. Uh, yeah. They also did. Uh, they dropped the straps. So these straps that we're kind of seeing, um, which they themselves say a touch of audacity on the wrist. The hey. Fagliano collection. Was this so they new? Draw, yeah, these are the, these are new straps. So. Five colors: blue, gray, beige, burgundy, and green. Cool, 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 cool. Four hundred and fifty bucks if you've got a reverso. That's not outrageous. It's not stupid for OEM strap. But it's kind of got that leather canvasy vibe to it. Yeah, it's a bit bit more casual. Hey, I know the straps. I just didn't realize they were uh, they were uh, new too. But that's cool. Um, what can I talk about? Uh, I know you're interviewing me, but there's another watch sort of in the same vein. Yeah. That I only saw yesterday, and what's that? I it was one of those watches where I looked at the press release and I was like, oh yeah, cool, and moved on with my life. Which it turns out was something of a mistake because it's a this this watch is a really really nice watch, and I think it's a good lesson to remember to always like, there's so many people on the internet going, Oh, this is shit. Well, not this watch in particular, but any watch like people debating Rolex case size by half a millimeter. I yep. know it's super privilegy, but you've got to see the watches before you make those calls make call. a lot of the time. Yeah. So the Zenith pilot, the new Zenith pilots collection. Yeah. Okay. On, on paper, Nothing fancy, like oh, okay, Zenith's got pilots. They've got the name. Yep. Like, they've got the sort of historic trademark of the name or whatever it is. They've re, you know, the old pilots were pretty big and retro. They've, um, you know, updated it. Cool, that's great. The forty millimeter. There's two. There's a, a time onlys and chronos at the moment. Mm. I really like the time onlys. I specifically liked the steel one. Yep. It's just a nice watch. Again, it's very Felix. Same sort of, but it's very anyone. Like uh, the the thing I immediately felt felt when I looked at it, picked it up, was this is really really it. It does a similar job on the wrist to an Aquanaut. Actually, it's got interesting a broad bezel, um, broad quite a flat case top. Slightly textured dial, like it's got uh, horizontal stripes on it uh, in black. Like it's not, it doesn't, you know, they're not trying to make a, a big deal of it. It's just a bit of texture to keep it interesting. Super crisp applied Arabics that reminded me of like those those nineties Aquanauts, you know, those variations. Mm-hmm. Uh, solid movement, like it's a, it's a El Primero without the chrono, as far as I can tell, but it's still got that like five hertz, um, the yeah, high yeah. beat. It's an El Primero movement. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 3620. Um, uh, 11,400 Australian dollars, 7,500 US dollars. Again, it's not, it's not, you know, the cheapest watch in the world, but it's solid. 
you'd be happy with that for like the rest of your life. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. It's sort of, I like the flat bezel. I think the, the kind of the lines on the dial, that line were yeah. quite a bit, bit broader. All, all the, all the on the wrist ergonomics nice wheel. and like, Oh that yeah, the date wheel. Nicely. I mean, this is kind of twee, but it actually does kind of sound like it. They've like gone. They've tried to make it sound like the uh, those clicker boards in old airports. Uh huh. You know how that like like the the flights would change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's the inspiration there. Is it inspiration? Is it a happy coincidence? Who knows? But it's cute. Well, they've got a kind of horizontal marker across the top of the date window to yeah yeah to do that. So. Yeah, interesting. So a bit of a and sleeper it's not, here. It's not. It's not too pilot. Like it's not like aviation. It's a. It's kind you know of what I mean? fieldy. It's kind of fieldy, if yeah. I'm honest. Yeah, it's a, it's an all terrain watch, Andy. All terrain. I just I don't know that I love pilot the way the the font of pilot on the dial, but I guess it works I understand. With the but also that's like that's kind the of thing. their big big sell, that's, you know, in a way. That's the big sell. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So. What else? What else oh, have you seen? Should I tell you another thing? This is a okay. this is no no another super niche thing. Um, so I visited Cartier a few times throughout the week. Yep. And every time in their booth, they had this yep. really sort of haunting violin music playing. Uh huh. Like this sort of uh, you know typical like some sort of soundscape vibe. Um, uh, you know, that was really, I was so familiar to him. Like, and I asked several people, I said, who does the music? And they didn't know. Uh, and uh, I eventually Googled it and I was right because I thought it sounded like Warren Ellis. Do you know who Warren Ellis is? I don't. No. So Warren Ellis is, um, turns out he's done the music for a series of short films that Jake Gyllenhaal worked on as well. Um, oh. He's an Australian musician who is in a band called the Dirty Three, but he did a lot right. of work with Nick with a lot of work with Nick Cave. And okay. He's done a lot of like film scores as well, um, like haunting haunting violins. So it's just it was on point. It was a really really cool use of. And we we should talk about the booths in a bit as well because yeah, I want to ask you about as, that. Like as far as like setting a mood it was like not like soft piano music because like you didn't hear it for a lot of the time and then it like sort of came in like, I don't know, brand building through space and like identity through sound and smell and all that kind of jazz that, that you get all that at Watches and Wonders as well. Like it's, it's a whole thing. Yeah, it all matters. Um, yeah. Do, do we want to... Do you want to tell talk, talk uh, about Shopa, the you, uh, Yeah, talk about Shopa the LUC... You see. 1860 caught my eye. Yeah. Uh, Tony Trainer from um, Hodinki, uh, I think, was quietly losing his shit about that. Um, well, maybe not so quietly. I don't know. Uh, that, but, yeah, that's that's a little that, – is that the 36.5 millimetre one? Mm. The, mm. The, the the recreation of the OG 90s LUZ? Stunning. Yeah, 18. Stunning, stunning yeah. watch. Bit small for me, let's be honest, but – um, really, really nice. Uh, you think it's a bit small for the you? other one that was nice was with a similar vibe of dial was the Alpine Eagle XPS. Interesting. It's a new movement yeah, in the Alpine a, Eagle, right? Could well be. <laughs> There's another one that they've got their like high beat, high frequency one that was actually cool mm-hmm. as well. It got a little bit less attention, but um, I don't know. The Alpine Eagle seems to have settled nicely into its into its uh, routine of you know, sporty, sporty chic. Interesting. Yeah. I think, I, I, I think I heard it on your movement, but yeah, I mean, I just want to, that, that show par LUC 1860, 36 mil, 36 K, I think Aussie. So you're paying a thousand dollars a mil. That's just um, 36. Everything. Very, <laughs> I, the movement looks remarkable. Like this is a, yeah, this is like um, a, a wow uh, watch. LUC is one of those um, salmon slept on man. I mean, I know Tony Trainers slept, slept on. It, but... um, like it's it's so good. And yeah, people inside watch a sort of really rate show part, but the rest of you know the broader the broader watch collecting and you know luxury community I don't think it's wonderful. It is a it wonderful is. looking watch. 
Yeah, like it's it, they're one of they're some of like the best movement makers around. Those OCs. God. Well, what next interviewer interviewer Andy what's what's the next question on your list of uh, chat GPT generated prompts <laughs> no these are all um, these are all Off the questions that have been pressing the top of my dome yeah <laughs> from the from the yeah the top of the dome uh, all right I think that's enough because we've we've chatted to Nick we've talked about these for ages the last thing I want to ask you is how the fair is itself because Basel world was a completely different beast it was exhausting walking and covering the square footage. Okay. The booths, some so, booths were three story, you know, we talked about it before we jumped on the call, you know, Hublot, mm-hmm. Rolex, like restaurants, cafes, mm-hmm, dozens mm-hmm. of meeting ro- meetings, meeting rooms. You'd be running around, you know, with no time between meetings across, you know, the, the, the fair. What's Switches and Wonders like? Like what's the, the, obviously it's a different location, but what are the booths sure. like? All right. Let me paint you a word picture. Let me mm. use my, my mind to weave a tapestry in your head. Yes. Uh, so the Pal Expo is a convention center next to the airport. Mm-hmm. So far, so good. Uh, you walk in and there's sort of, you go through security. There's like proper, like airport security, mm-hmm. um, you know, swipe gates. Um, and you walk in and there's two wings, essentially. To the left is the old wing, which was uh, SIHH, which yep. is essentially unchanged. To the right okay. is... The new guys that have come from Baselworld. I'll talk about the left first. Mm-hmm. It's a very everyone sort of has the same facade. Okay, uh, like it's a lot of sort of beige walls. Like it's one cohesive look. It's not like Baselworld where they're all like changing the colors and doing different things. Yeah, like chaotic like, and fit out. You know, and, sort of beige yep. walls with windows, and then there's where the booths open up is where they get a little bit crazy. Okay, um, and in terms of there's, the, there's some hierarchy there. Like Cartier has like, I don't know, at least twice as much floor space as everyone else. <laughs> uh, you know, Van Cleef has got good position. IWC has got a really big space. Like there's, you know that this is not a, there's some, I'm sure there's lots of Richmond board meetings about this sort of stuff. Um, and it's all, you know, very, very sort of subtle and Swiss. Or maybe it's not, I don't know, maybe we're reading too much into it. But as I sort of said with Cartier, they all they all express their brands in very different ways. Mm. And they, they do a really good job of telling stories. Like IWC, for example, is very, very open, very, very German, very like they had like a um, like a prototype Mercedes uh, on the sort of this big open floor and they brought in a bunch of their testing machines from the, mm-hmm. from the factory to like show how, you know, how they're sort of all about function and technical uh, innovation. And then around all that, because for the mood that they were trying to do was this sort of 70s vibe, they had mm. had like all these vintage design icons like, you know, Dieter Ram's coffee machines and, you know, Eames chair. Like they'd mm. done like set dressing to build that world. Wow. On the other hand, over the road, you know, Von Cleef and Appels, they had worked with a Italian glass, like a Murano glass, Venetian glass, uh, artist to sort of build this, I think it was like a forest at sunset was the, was the brief. And it's okay. very dark and very opulent. And you go in and there's like le- like sort of l- this leafy tree made of like glass leaves. And it's all very romantic and mysterious. Uh, then around the corner is uh, Roger Dubuis, who had a great booth. Um, it was like super intense. It was like kind of somewhere between an ad for, I don't know, an energy drink uh, and a, a crypto platform, but it really worked. Like they had, there was like robotic arms that served you drinks. There were those creepy little walking dog robots. There was lots of all the sort of the booth attendants were in like severe, vaguely sci-fi white dresses with, you know, post dystopian haircuts. It's What was that robot dog thing? What was that about? Just walking around, being into robot dog. Being it's a bit creepy. terrifying. Yeah, very terrifying. Um, it was also their security. Like if you tried to walk out with a, a watch, it would run after you and hunt you down with laser eyes. Interesting. That might be unconfirmed. Um, well, I'm uh, definitely going to have to be there And, and Panerai, uh, Panerai had like, you know, their sort of a deconstructed sailing yacht. Oh, by mm-hmm. the way, Panerai, those, um, the new radio mirrors with the aged cases – yeah. Proper, like old school, cool Panerai, like real, real vintage vibes, but like sort of, they still felt modern, modern and hefty. I, mm. I was really into them. Like, they did. You got pics? We'll have to post know, some pics up. 
Oh, on, on the Discord, Andy. On oh. the Discord. Let me just pop. Got to get on on the Watchers Wonders 2023. What was the food like? <laughs> I <laughs> didn't eat. Um, you know <laughs> I didn't really all? eat uh, in the day. Like so, I'd have, okay. I knew I knew this would be the situation. I had a big breakfast at the hotel. Yep. I existed off coffee, Coca Cola, and orange juice and sparkling water yep. um, throughout the day. Uh, and maybe like once or twice, I'd get like a little a little roll. Little, but little this is an interesting roll. thing. Our um, my, my former colleague and and our good friend Nick Kenyon mm. uh, remarked on this. He was there last year, um, mm. and he said it was a totally different vibe. Like, has seen it mostly because China and a lot of Asian markets weren't there last year. Um, he said you, you would sit down and someone would come to you and bring your food. This year yep. was like what I was more used to was like. You fight for a table and, you know, some very stressed servers would eventually come to you. Now it's all by QR code and stuff. But no, the food looked fine. It's like, it was like high-end catering food. Um, there was, you know, obviously free champagne. Ob- obviously free champagne. Obviously. Um, <laughs> duh. <laughs> it's a watch fair without free champagne. Mm. Uh, but yeah, it was all very beautiful. And like, you know, some of the... Oh, uh, JLC had brought in like a, a pastry chef that had a relationship with this... Uh, very fancy pastry chef, and I, I sat down and we had a meeting with, with the Australian brand manager. We had a little pastry; it was really, really great. Like genuinely, some of the best fancy pastries I've ever eaten. So there's all they all do that sort of stuff too. And I'm, oh, sorry, uh, the East Wing. Sorry, we got distracted by the Richmond side. The East Wing is yep. the bar, the Basel World guys. So mm-hmm. Patek booth is the same. Rolex booth is the same. Show part is the same. Tudor now has their own separate booth, but it's just very similar. Uh, the LVMH guys were sort of around the outer wall, um, mm-hmm. and they had they were sort of more set back into, like they had a, a, a not an open facade as much. Okay. And then there was a Chanel and Bell and Ross, uh, an Oris and Grand Seiko sort of around there as well. But you know, I think it was deliberate that Rolex and Patek got to keep their um, their existing. Fit outs, and yeah, and that was like that was one of my things at the start. Of, oh, I don't know what the layout is; it might be confusing. But then I walked around. And I'm like, oh, it's exactly the same as Hall One at Basel World. So, um, but my biggest mistake of the fair was scheduling meetings uh, at opposite ends of the um, the Pal Expo. Yeah, it'd be like a. Well, you don't know when you're doing it. You don't know when you're scheduling where things are. Well, I mean. I, I would have known it with the Richemont ones, uh, mm. but I just didn't really think about it. Like, so I'd be going literally from one end to the other, which is probably, I don't know, what, 500 metre walk, maybe 800 metre walk each time. Uh, who knows God. what distance is? It could, it's probably much less than that, but. Uh, well, at yeah. least we went, you know, I remember the days of us lugging around suitcases and bags and backpacks I, I, full of camera and, equipment. And that's. Yeah, Dying. that honestly yeah. for me that was the other really big change like obviously I was working with Revolution and I'm you know helping with their content but I'm sort of I wasn't with their main video team mm. um, so I was much freer to experience the product sessions and have the meetings and talk to the people and do the interviews mm-hmm. in their own rights and that was kind mm-hmm. of a first for me like I could take the time, like I would go back and see a brand maybe twice sometimes, maybe three times, you know, I'd have the product, I'd have an interview, I'd catch up with the the local brand manager or whatever, which is a very different experience. And I think um, uh, for me, it was really, really worthwhile. It was a, and also I got to catch up with people I haven't seen in three or four years, you know? So um, yeah, that were highlights for me. Yeah, wild. Well, where to next? Uh, like I said before, I'm probably going to collapse onto a bed in the next uh, five to ten minutes. Um, no, I mean, you've got more plants. You're not done with Geneva. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. But but after that, uh, I'm, I'm hanging around in Geneva this weekend. I might sort of take some time off. I might, I might pop into the ACHI. Um, mm-hmm. I caught up with a couple of the indies uh, at a revolution event last night. Uh, oh, the fondue but, party. Should we talk about that quickly? You, you... <sighs> before that, but... Uh, uh, then I'm heading off to see manufacturers of Jurat Perigueux and Ulysse Nantin, um, which will be exciting. Uh, yeah, fondue party. Apparently, that's a, a revolution thing. Um, yeah, it's an infamous, infamous party. Been going on for years. Yeah. Uh, it was really fun. Uh, it was very hectic. 
Um, but it was a good catch. Lots of people there, lots of you know familiar faces, uh, lots of former guests. Uh, mm-hmm. I ran into to Harris from MBNF, and Max was there. And Harris told me that Ma- we were. I think he said we were Max's first podcast. Oh, no, wow. no, Perfect. Silas. We were Silas from a Collected Man's first podcast. Yep, yep. I did <sighs> convince him to come on. I remember. Mm, yeah, he's well, you know it's it's nice catching up with you know seeing these people, and I got to see. Um, uh, Sylvain Pinot, who's got uh, a very hot watch at the moment, and I've, I've spoken to him, you know, via Zoom, but never met him in real life. Uh, mm. My boy Elaine Silberstein was there with, um, I suspect, his his wife, um, but I didn't really talk to him because he was, you know, deep in conversation with, I assume, people he's been friends with for decades. Um, yeah, it was a it was a whole vibe. It was very very. We, I don't know if I should say this or not, but I, I think they may have kicked us out. <laughs> you know the, the staff of the fondue place which itself is sort of like at the end of a pier i think it's quite famous in in geneva okay um yeah it's like it's not fancy at all it's it's sort of like i think it's you know, the geneva equivalent of like sea baths like you sort of right. s- can swim in the lake and there's a fondue right, place right. attached because switzerland um but yeah it was a it was a pretty fun night awesome oh, and i can't like say a, anything more well than wind. that <laughs> Well, it sounds like you need to go have your little nap um, and then continue on with your adventures. Good to talk to you, Andy. Good to catch up. Um, All right. And thanks, Tag Hoyer, lest we forget, Carrera, 39, Glass Box Sapphire. It's incredible yeah, watch. Yeah, amazing. Amazing work from, from Tag Hoyer this year. And a uh, quick plug to our Discord. Jump in there. Hit us up on our socials, OT the podcast at gmail.com. And make sure you leave a five-star review if you've enjoyed this content in the years before. Then definitely share it, five-star it. And we will see you guys next week. And next time I talk to you, I might be back in Australia. Who knows? Possibly. All right, catch up. See you later, Gator.